Hi, and welcome to Jung at Harp. This is a series of conversations between me, Deborah Henson Conant, and Kathleen Wiley about the place where music and Jungian analysis meet. Right now, we're talking about the seven strings of passion that are at the heart of a book, a class, and a concert that I've created. Kathleen, did you want to say something too? Yeah, and part of what Deborah and I are going to be looking at is how those strings of passion that she connects and works with so deeply in her music and creative process actually have correlates in our psyche. And so that when we can begin to work with those same strings of passion within our own nature, we find ourselves able to live more fully and more wholly, and thus also more creatively with our music. Wow, and I'm really excited about today's conversation. And so why don't I just start by saying how I experienced impulse. So when I started creating these strings of passion, it was really all about deconstructing or distilling my process of creative expression, asking myself, how do I get from creative impulse to actually creative expression. And one of the reasons I ask myself this is because I'm both a jazz musician where the impulse and the expression happen almost spontaneously. Mm -hmm. I also write musicals and orchestra works where the impulse and the expression can be months, years, decades separate. And so, I was just really interested in how that impulse can stay alive and how it, what are, the, what are all the steps in between that? So impulse is the first mm. string in the strings of passion. The impulse, I experienced it as the impulse to do, to be, to touch, to experience that first impulse. So, and, and, and lately I've been thinking about, because one of the exercises in the program is to go back and look at some of those very first impulses that have played out in my life. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear what you have to say, first of all, about the basic principle. And then I'd love to look at some of these in, in, within that principle, within, yes. within what you're going to say. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, there are two things that come to mind for me um, that Jungian psychology really from, for me, connects to impulse. And the first is Jung's whole idea of psychic energy or libido. Because for Jung, he differed with Freud. Freud said all libido is sexual in nature, and Jung didn't, did not agree with that. He said that the libido was the life force. He had an idea about uh, the libido that's much more akin to the Eastern tradition idea of chi that there is an energy that flows through us, the life force. And Jung says that all of our psyches have a natural gradient that our libido will follow if left unobstructed. So that there is a natural traje trajectory of our own psychic libido or our own soul's energy. And of course that in all areas of our life, but definitely also in the creative process. So that impulse that you may feel that manifests tomorrow or that may not manifest for five years in the creative work is something that it, it's like a fire. It's like a fire. We could use that image of fire. And sometimes when, you know, we tend the fire, it's bigger and it's stronger and we feel more heat from it. And other times when we go away from it, it kind of may dwindle down and get to the stage of coals. But if it's something out of one's own soul, it stays alive, you know. It's so interesting because I was looking back over the class today and I was looking over the meditation that I have students do at the mm -hmm. beginning of the class and it describes there is a smoldering yeah. and out of that and out of that smoldering it comes the fire and and then you you go and then what comes out of that is an archetype that can speak to you mm -hmm. and so you're basically just enriching that idea Yes. And since you mentioned archetype, the other thing that comes up for me around impulse is Jung's whole um, theory of the psychic structure. And he says that the deepest layer of our psyche, which is unconscious, contains both instincts and archetypes. And he put instincts and archetypes on a continuum. And he used the analogy of the light spectrum and said the instinct is the um, infrared end of the light spectrum and the archetype is the ultraviolet end 
that again, it's all psychic energy, but, and, and that they actually, they, they complete each other. So that every instinct, which we can think of for the moment as, a, as an impulse, a biological prompt, something that's just kind of naturally within our being um, biologically, that every prompt that is biological has behind it an archetypal energy, which is an imprint and an image and an emotion that corresponds to that. Now, when you said spectrum, the first thing I, I, I thought of, or I, maybe you didn't say spectrum, but when you said this continuum, I thought about the continuum of water from vapor to ice. Yeah. And so yeah. almost, like, almost like it's the same thing, but it's in solid form. So is it in a more solid form as an archetype than as an instinct, or am I looking at it differently? Actually, we might, I, I would think of it that the instinct is the more solid form because it's in matter. It's biological. It's, there is some uh, cellular central nervous system um, manifestation of it, whereas the archetype is disembodied. And the archetype, it's always a numinous. The, the archetype we could think of in, in Greek mythology, all the gods and goddesses represent various archetypes. Well, you know, you can't, um, you can't ever control a god, <laughs> so to speak. You can't control an archetype. You can't make them come. You can't, but what you can do is- No, oh, wait, are they like cats? <laughs> Well, I won't go so that far. I don't want to offend the gods. <laughs> but but their energies, if, if you think about them, um, um, you know, the archetype is like the is like the um, spiritual imprint. It's the invisible. If you think about the, the ultraviolet end of the light spectrum, with our naked eye, we can't see that. But with highly developed tools, we can. And so the archetype will energies are like that they kind of live in the invisible realm and we can't pick them up with our physical senses but yet if we're ever in the presence of an archetype it's like an experience it's a numinous experience if this when people have an experience of god they're having a numinous experience okay i gotta stop you here you okay. were saying the word numinous correct yes. okay so i just have to tell you that this word is this huge um, is this huge word in my life, uh -huh. Numenon, right? Yes. So when I was a kid, I was playing a game with my family and this game was called Dictionary, where mm -hmm. we would find a word in the dictionary that we figured nobody knew. Everyone would make up a definition and the person who was it would write the actual definition in the dictionary. So you were constantly looking for a, a definition that you thought nobody would think was real. Right. And one day I was looking through the dictionary and I found this word Numenon, the definition of which, if I remember correctly, was a thing in itself as separate from its physical experience or its yes. physical existence. And I just, this was a profound moment in my life. Mm -hmm. I found this word. I knew this was my word. Mm -hmm. And within the game, I knew nobody would guess it because it would just sound like the kind of thing I would make up. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's become at the heart of so much of what I'm looking for, and even in the strings of passion at the idea of distillation of anything into what it is separate from how it appears. Yes, yeah. So, and once you can do that, it can become anything. Yes, yeah. And, and where I go to with music for me, I know with my heart, when I can really feel the song, if I go to the archetype being both image and emotion, when I really feel the emotion of the song, then images that hold that emotion come and that can then flow through me and into my fingers to the strings. So are you saying that an archetype is not like a god or, you know, the princess, Di you know, the, the queen, the whatever, goddess Diana, but an archetype is really the Numen, is really the thing in itself Yes. As separate with how it's displaying right now. Yes, absolutely. And that is, that is very much Jung's belief and Jung's writing that the archetype can never be experienced directly. It is only experienced 
indirectly. It's kind of like in the, um, in the Judeo Christian scriptures, the idea that you can't look upon the face of God and live. Uh -huh. So God appears to Moses in the burning bush because had he, um, or he goes up on the mountain and he comes back down with the Ten Commandments and he's changed, you know, because he has been in that presence. So the numinous is, it is just that is something in and of at the essence and it thus transforms whatever. You know, it's the difference between working from an ego perspective and efforting with your music and doing the work of tilling the soil of your musical abilities and then just letting it happen. Wow. Which is what I love to teach people how to mm -hmm. do, give them the tools so that in that moment they can express themselves with right. whatever they have. Right. Yeah, it's like giving them, I mean, this goes to string number two This in the strings of passion structure. It's like giving them the structures so that they feel safe enough to let go. Right. That having even just a little bit of structure can help you right. to, to be out of that. Like, what do I do now? Right, right. So let, let's go, let's just take an example here. I, I was thinking about some examples in my life um, of when I had a moment of impulse. and. Um, one of uh, I actually wrote some down here. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So I wrote three down. I wrote when I first read my first novel when I was eight, and and then came to school and was like, I'm going to write a book. And all the kids were like, You can't write a book. Grownups write book. And and so I was just like, Oh, I guess I can't write a book. So that was just one moment um, mm -hmm. that was full of a bunch of different things. I don't know if it's an impulse. Uh, there was the moment when I first heard Debussy's La Mer and everything that that opened up in my life. There was the first time I got a three ring binder. And uh -huh. I was like, wow, this is powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I guess those are, um, I guess those are three, three of them. I was thinking about musicals because I have always had the impulse to make music put music and story together mm -hmm. and I don't remember the uh, like a first moment of impulse so I kind of wanted to look at those three impulses one where I had a beautiful impulse that was squelched right another where I had a, a, a huge impulse that I didn't even know how I would do and WC just opened up my life and the third was a, a, a physical thing mm -hmm. that opened up a possibility Mm -hmm. um, segmentation and or order and like I could shift things around. So um, what are, I mean, which one, like, which one are you most interested in talking about? Um, well, I, I love three ring binders. <laughs> um, okay. But I want to say about all three of them, and we can talk more specifically about just one. With all three of those, all three of those things, that impulse to write a book, constellated some emotional feeling in you. The, and, and we might even imagine there was probably some emotion or felt sense that you have even had that the image of book and writing a book came up. So we see in that impulse, the instinctive prompt to creativity and the archetypal presence of both an emotion or a strong felt sense and an image the book being the image. Um, the three ring binder was something physical that somehow connected you to something larger. Right, to that, possibilities. That, the possibilities, yeah. And, and that ability to contain a possibility where we could then get our mind around it and handle it and shape it. Right. So right. again, the binder constellated a certain set of emotions and images. So, and the music, Debussy's La Mer for you, again, it sounds like you had a numinous experience. It just like took you to another world and a world that wasn't imagined by your ego, but that just came. It just, you were, you were transported there. Right. So now you're making me think more. So when it was for Debussy, I heard it on our stereo and I was about 11 and I tried to literally crawl into the stereo. When I came, my parents came home, I was under the stereo. My head was stuck there and I was sobbing 
And I was, my impulse was I wanted to get inside that music. I wanted to be inside of it. And I finally achieved that as I wrote for symphony orchestra as a soloist, I could have that experience of being inside the music. Oh, wow. And yeah. And with the book, it was, I read a book and I was like, wow, I want to do that. Uh (laughs) So that was a different, one was, I need to be inside of that. The other was like, wow, I want to do that. And the third with the three three ring binder was like, oh my gosh, what a tool this is. Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about them again? I know you just did, but I loved how when you just kind of talked about them as these are three different kinds of impulses and yet they're all, they have something in common. Yes, yeah. And what they all three, if we start back at the beginning, they all three have in common is they constellated a certain set of emotion or what I I like sometimes to talk about as a felt sense. Yeah. And with that felt sense, there was some image that came. And and that felt sense and that image prompted action. You know, the beautiful thing about the three ring binder is it prompts action. So if we go back to the idea of the instinct being the infrared and the archetype, the ultraviolet, it's like this ultraviolet energizes and enlivens and creates a felt sense. And then this infrared puts it into action. Wow. Okay. So that immediately makes, do you want to talk more about that? Well, and I was just going to say, and the action you took, um, crawling underneath the stereo, trying to get into the music. I mean, at that time, I don't know how old you were, but I was 11. Yeah. You, that was the only thing you knew, but you had to take an action because I think that's the other thing that's important to remember is that when we truly experience an archetype, there is going to be an action that happens. Wow. So at 11, the only action I knew how to take was to literally try to crawl into it. As an adult, I started to be able to think that I could get that experience by creating a symphonic work and putting myself literally in the middle of it. Yes. And so the first impulse happened very quickly. I just crawled. Right. The second one took a long time. And the difference there is that we, every day, all day long, we are taking actions based on impulses that are instinctive and totally unconscious. You know, habits are basically unconscious. The difference is what you did as an adult and as you developed your own musical abilities and confidence is you consciously made some choices about how to channel this energy, how to like, you know, create a riverbed where it would flow into something, you know? And, no. and, and no. that's the difference between ex- having an impulse that's instinctive and archetypal, having it unconsciously, meaning out of our awareness, or having it consciously, consciously registering it and then beginning to relate to it, or I like to say dance with it. Uh Uh-huh. So let this, this brings me to situations where you are stuck and you can't situations Uh where for whatever reason you, you are, um, you are stuck in a state of depression or a state of, of, of of fear, Mm -hmm. all the little tiny states that we're all, you know, stuck in and that I'm assuming therapy and, you know, recovery and whatever it is that those are all unraveling or to unravel. What happens when um, that impulse is thwarted? I mean, like, that's the biggest question. Like, can you talk about that? Or that, and that's probably what your, all your work is about. <laughs> well, from a psychological perspective, we become neurotic. I mean, you, I mean, Jung says that when we fought, when the libido, the psychic libido can flow unobstructed, unthwarted in its natural direction, we're healthy physically, emotionally, mentally. But where that energy gets thwarted or blocked, we become unhealthy. And psychologically, that often means neurotic. And neurosis can show up with things that get labeled like depression or anxiety. But in truth, we all... We all have to learn how to mediate those very primitive, i.e. unconscious, 
non-rational states and the most basic of which is survival fear and that anxiety if you know survival fear takes so many sophisticated forms and stress is a fancy word for fear ah, <laughs> you know? right. and the problem is that our central nervous system is often kicking in with the survival fear when it's not at all the situation so we're in traffic and the energy we need to run from the line and the jungle kicks in but we can't do anything but sit at the stoplight and wait right and so it, it, it kind of atrophies or something right so why is it called neurosis what does that word mean what why did it why is that word used what does it re refer to well neuro Jung makes a distinction between neurosis and psychosis he says that we that we become neurotic when we have defenses against the unconscious we become psychotic when the unconscious possesses us. So for instance, if in childhood, let's go back to your impulse to write a book being squashed and your classmates saying, you can't write a book. Right. And you know, unfortunately there wasn't anybody there to intervene and said, of course you can, you know, come on over here. Let's have, what do you, and begin to help you imagine that and create it. So let's just use that. So here you have this impulse coming out to write a book. It gets squashed. So something of you in that moment got shut down and could have gotten really like locked up, like a turtle shell could have gone around it to where there was a hard carapace where you couldn't access that energy anymore. And so then here you get to be where you are now and you're working on your book, The Strings of Passion, but you find yourself just kind of never being able to sit down and do it. And, the, and, and one theory we might play with is that it's because the energy is hidden behind that wall, that shell, because when the impulse you felt at the strongest, it got squashed and it hurt too much. Mm. So it's like, what got set in motion unconsciously is a protective maneuver right so you don't hurt again right and so that's the other thing to remember is that all of our neuroses are an attempt at our psyche for at psyche's best attempt at a cure i right. mean it, 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 it doesn't work in the way we want as adults so part of it really to get that energy free i'm, I'm just playing for a minute because you might be writing fun on your book no but i think it's a great example and i just want to say that many musicians many people i work with are struggling with that they're yeah. in the carapace so please go on yeah go on. and so part of it then is we have to begin to tend the carapace and by tend it i mean we have to be able to begin to bring a compassionate presence to that part of ourselves and say wow you know, because the tendency is we want to beat ourselves up. Well, why can't you just sit down and do it? Oh, well, let's just, why can't I just put the timer on like my coach suggests? Oh, you know, what, what difference does it make? It doesn't matter if no one else likes it. We try to talk ourselves through it. Right. And what's needed is to just sit with it and say, oh, how so sad that got shut down. You know, it reminds me of the Tao Te Ching when it says that there's nothing softer nor thinner than water yet to move the heart in unyielding, it has no equal. We all know this, yet we forget. And well, I think that, that again, this yeah. is water, which I love. Yeah, there is nothing softer nor thinner than water, yet to move the heart in unyielding, it has no equal. This we all know, but forget. And psychologically, water corresponds to emotion. So when we can sit with ourselves in our stuckness and let whatever sadness, ever grieving, even anger, anger is not bad. We just don't want to turn, our, use the anger to turn on ourselves and destroy ourselves. That's the right. problem. But to sit with that and, and ultimately to be able to move to a place of compassionate presence. So this is really interesting. So you, um, I mean, just you, when you said anger, when we don't want to turn it on ourselves, I was mm -hmm. thinking about what you said about impulse and archetype and how one is, or, or instinct and archetype, how one is in action and one is just the thing itself, numinous. Right. And so it sounds like you're saying that to, um, that with these feelings like anger that have created all kinds of dis, um, 
or anger, resentment, fear, comparing all the things that create, you know, addiction and hiding and right. stuckness, that um, it is when we put them into action, that they become, they start cutting us off. And when we can get back to just the numinous, just being with what they are and sitting with what they are, that's like being in water. That's like going to the, um, almost like the, the, the state, uh, the, what is it, the state, you know, of water, there's ice, there's, there's water, and then there's vapor. It's almost like going to the state of vapor. Yes. Yeah. And that vapor then goes back into the test tube and becomes water again. So that there's, we Whoa, might think I about see. it as a, as a figure eight between the archetype and the entity, between the essence and the form. And it's that flow that we want. It can't be if it's one sided. If it's one sided, it never manifests. It never becomes embodied. We never create the project. There's got to be the flow between the, the archetypal disembodied essence, spirit, vapor state back in to the earth of the instinct. So yeah, so it's so um so the, I, what I'm hearing you say is that it's not all about taking a numinous experience and turning it into a physical where the, you know it's not all about taking an impulse and turning it into a um a thing. There's also many many things that we want to go back and find the and get go back to the impulsive moment or the and 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 unlock it. Right. Right. And again, if we just go back to what happened to you with your impulse for your book and right. your classmate to really be able to live with and love that child part of you that got shut down, that somehow in your largesse, your, your being out there was told you were too much. And then I can only imagine how you've had to struggle with that throughout your career. Yeah, and and or even not struggle by simply, you know, at that moment, you know, as I was trying to learn how how one is a human being, right? What is possible? What is impossible? Um, and and even that those things may or may not exist. That moment I remember was a moment when I felt like, oh, oh, I see, I'm wrong about this. Oh, I thought I could just do it. Ah, mm -hmm. but they're telling me that a child cannot do this. Okay, got it. All right. So yeah, got. It. But then I certainly never got out of that. Yeah, yeah. It's like internalizing a false belief would be another way we might talk about it. That's a more cognitive way of talking about it. But on a deep feeling level, the impulse, both the instinctive action and the archetypal prompt with emotion and image got blocked and walled off. To right. Some and, and, so, so, and this must happen to many, many, many people. Yes. Like, yeah. does it, does it, is there anyone it doesn't happen to? <laughs> I've not met them. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, we all have this in, in, in varying ways. I mean, you know, uh, horrific traumas are some of the, where we see the worst blocks. But um, this happens to, to all of us in various ways. And I think part of wholeness and fullness and definitely living a creative life, which Jung was very much all about, mm -hmm. um, really does mean being able to go back and reconnect to these parts of ourselves that got split off. And it's not an intellectual cognitive connecting with, but it's really feeling. It's being present with the water, <laughs> the flow. Right. Yeah. So one of the first things I ask in the class, one of the first exercises that I have students do is to go look at the art, their own or other people's or, or just something that somebody else has shared. There's actually a whole page mm -hmm. of things that people have shared and to look at them and, and try to um, and, and notice what comes up. Notice mm -hmm. the judgment that comes up. The judgment like either the, the dismissing the work that they're seeing or dismissing themselves, comparing, um, look at that, just look at that and, and try to see what it is, and then try to find something to love in mm -hmm. one of these things. And I observed that, like you said, that 
there is, I, you didn't say this, but I heard mm -hmm. this, um, there's no change without love. You can, there, right. there, that carapace cannot, there's no, it, it, any, any judgment, any, that will just make it harder. So That's right. it only changes with love. And then, and this is just an opportunity for people to go in and experience what happens when you find one thing to love in anything, Yes. how it opens that up for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because judgment is a defense against feeling, I believe. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. And so when you create defense, you're just creating this wall and you're just right. creating it and you keep creating it. Aha. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. Yeah. So judgment, judgment is a defense. And so when we can be, let's just say with someone else's work, even if it does not speak to us, but we can say, huh, I'm, I'm not feeling a resonance in it. So what does that mean for me? Does it mean, you know, we always want to make it about the other. Uh -huh. That's the judgment. Except for when it's like, I'm not good enough. Except when we judge ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And Practicing, and developing compassion. I really, I, that ability to just be with and let it be. It, it, it is what it is. You know, and when we can do that, I think I, what I hear you saying is we're then we're getting get, getting it into that water state where we can actually drink it. Yes. And it can become part of us. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. yeah, is there, it's always, is there something, so that was, that's one exercise that I have students to do because they're, these are students. Oh, I know. And I know what they're always going to mm -hmm. say to me. They're going to be like, well, then how am I going to know if what I'm doing is any good? I'm just going to go out there and I'm just going to do something that's bad. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, we all know that there's going to be judgment in the world, no matter what. I mean, right. every time I change what I do in the world, I used to play straight ahead jazz when I started bringing more of myself into it or when I started singing, every moment along the way, there was kick pushback, like saying, you're ruining what you're doing. You, it, you were better before, or that's not good enough or whatever. So um, what do you say to people? Because we can't move or shift if we're just trying to do something that's better or good or like, yeah, we have to give up the notion of better or good and really go for wholeness. I mean, this again is the, the thrust of Jung's notion of individuation, that when we individuate, we become whole. We are able to make room for all the parts of ourself, all our impulses, all our prompts, and we make room for those in a whole that can live together. You know, so it's informed by values. It's informed by conscious choice. It's not that people just randomly do whatever, um, but that we make room. And so part of what you've done in your evolution as a musician and as a woman is you've made room for all of your creative impulses. And yeah, the straight jazz people didn't want that because they don't want the whole. They just want, instead of the whole hand, they want a finger. Or maybe it's even only a thumbnail. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, that, well, that's what speaks to them. I mean, there's nothing wrong with yeah. it. It's yeah, it's absolutely nothing yeah. wrong with it. Again, we all have to follow the prompt of our own psyche soul. You know, but what you're describing is you instinctively felt a push or a pull towards different kinds of expression that live inside of you. Right. Yes. It wasn't right. enough for you to be limited. Right. I and in every moment of free, in every um, um, avenue of freedom that I looked for, mm -hmm. I realized that it, it, it hit a point where it became a, a box instead of freedom. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not, maybe not for other people, but for me, because yeah. of who I am. And, and this is why when, what I love working with in terms of students, I don't ever work with, you know, children. Mm -hmm. I'm working with adults, who, primarily with adults who have either come to the harp late mm -hmm. in their lives, sometimes in their 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, or people who are recovering harpists, they played and then they stopped and then they came back or professional right. harpists who were looking how to, you know, um, you know, become free and, 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 and liberate themselves from the page. That, as, as a teacher, that's what I'm doing. And what I love is instead of learning how to play the harp or teaching how to play the harp, I want to help people use it as a platform 
uh -huh. or who they actually are. That's just what's exciting to me. How can you right. not stop who you are and become a harpist, but how can you take everything you are mm -hmm. and be able to express it or share it in the world much more fully because with this instrument. And so, as you know, I'm always stressing fluency, mm -hmm. not perfection, not technical ability, but fluency. And it's really funny because now we're talking about water, the fluency, <laughs> fluency. the ability the to actually, right. The ability to yeah. be in that moment and move. Yeah. yeah. And what do you want to say about that? <laughs> well, I think that when we can go with the flow of who we are, there's such a joy and satisfaction of living we experience. And, you know, I think one way we can help ourselves dip into the water more is the practice of gratitude. I mean, there's even research now from neuroscience about what happens in the central nervous system when we offer gratitude. So, you know, pr the practice of gratitude, and that's such a different practice than judgment. Right. And so your exercise of having students look at other people's work and find one thing they love mm -hmm. really is connect is, is it i see also as an act of gratitude right it's i like, see that i'm thankful for the beauty of this or i'm thankful this helped me remember this experience or you know so i think that you know part of the being in the flow is we when we offer gratitude it, that's kind of a doorway into that and then we feel carried you know, we, we yeah. swim down the river. That's yeah. right. And what I'm, what I'm hearing and what you're saying now is I'm thinking if we can, if we could get to the point where we're loving each thing that we're doing, each mm -hmm. movement that we're making, or we're finding something to love in it, it's like living in the gratitude of it. Yes. And that does create fluency because it pushes out the, the, the judgment and lets us actually be in that fluency. That's right. And you know, what came to my, my mind was, so here we are in the river and there are all these rocks and we might think about the judgments as rocks. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, and when we crash against the rocks, the flow is blocked. Now we might get back in it, but it's like a being, it's a, a being knocked up against something. So if we can, we can choose a way, and I believe gratitude or the practice of loving kindness is a way we can choose to stay in the flow instead of getting over on the bank with the rocks where we crash. Right. That's right. Because if we just go straight down the river and try to go, go straight, we're probably going to hit a bunch of rocks. Right. But if we let ourselves shift with the water as the water is shifting, then right. we don't. And, and that doesn't mean denying. You can't do that and deny your judgments. But it's like when it comes up, you can say, oh, wow, look at that judgment. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Does that have anything to tell me about me? You know, it, again, we don't even, we don't judge ourselves for judgment, right. <laughs> you know, but we become curious and say, huh, I wonder what that's about. Or gosh, that seems to happen a lot in this situation. You know, is there something in that for me? And really being open to even dialoguing with our judgment to see what it has to tell us. Because behind the judgment, my guess, is some part of self that's walled off. Wow. Okay. All right. So um, if we were to recap kind of what we, what we said today, if we were to recap it and then also give people just like one thing to try to do, mm -hmm. I'm thinking what I'm hearing in your recap is learning that there's this, this spectrum that goes between the numinous, the, the, the thing in itself, the feeling, the, uh, the, the felt experience, I think you call yes. it. Yes. Um, and, and through to what, through to a spectrum of where we're acting on that we're, yes um okay where we're yes. acting on that and and to understand that that spectrum is there and as we go back and forth and not even back and forth like this but back and forth like this yes that is how we and we we can start creating flow yes with fluency in what we're doing creatively and that is how we can start to um, melt those carapaces, the, the thing that has held, has, we've built over the energy, the creative energy that we have. Yes. And all of us have that. So we could all be expressing more of that. Yes, absolutely. That's well, that's a beautiful summary because it really is the going back and forth between the impulse 
the movement to action, the instinct, and that energy of emotion and image that draws us and letting those two flow so that it's like a constant, there's a constant coming into form, then a constant going back to essence, and then the new form emerges you know, it's, it's kind of the creative process. And, you know, again, cognitively, we get at that, okay, we do a first draft, then we go back and we do a second draft. But what you and I are talking about is really recognizing that there is a power greater than, than ourself, than the ego uh -huh. at work here. And if we can learn again to, to consciously tend to that, Oh, so we're learning to actually, I see, we're learning to dance with that. To dance with it, yes. And, and that comes in later in the Strings of Passion. As you're saying it, I'm, it's, it's, it's triggering all the thing, the mm -hmm. whole idea of leadership and followership and how we can do both at once, listening and playing at the same time, distillation and undistillation, deconstruction and liftoff, all of those things that come later. So what is one thing that people can do? I mean, this one thing that I encourage mm -hmm. people to do is, is to look at, at, at your own work, whatever it is, whatever it is, and um, look at the judgments that come up Mm -hmm. just, just observe them mm -hmm. um, and maybe observe where they happen in your body and then find one thing to love. Yes. So that's something that I think anyone can do as many times as they want in each day, but at least once. So yeah. that would be what I would encourage people to do. What would you, what would you suggest? Would be yeah. Answer. And mine would be an extension of that, which is to offer gratitude that to find something to offer gratitude for. And even if the gratitude is, wow, I'm glad at least I'm consciously aware of my resistance to sitting down and practicing in this moment. Okay. I'm thankful I can see that. Oh, wow. I'm really thankful that I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there's something more behind my block here than just, oh, I can't do it. You know, so even starting with the gratitude of a, for consciousness, for awareness. And the other thing I also think is really finding a visual, whether it's the river or this figure A or it's the light spectrum, to, to find a visual to really be able to dialogue with what's happening in oneself around impulses, you know? That's great. And as you were talking, I was realizing that when you add gratitude to the observation, so I was asking people to observe, and then when you add gratitude to that, you are adding action. Because yeah. it is an action. And, and then I would like people, myself and everyone, to be thinking also about where is the desire in that? Because mm -hmm. what is the desire? When we're jealous of somebody, uh, what is the desire behind that? I want to do, I want. That's right. and, and our desire is, so, is, is an amazing thing to give the world. Yes. And since you mentioned that, I believe when people are jealous or when people are envious, mm. then the root issue is they're not living their own creative impulse. Right. Okay. And so when we have a moment of jealousy for someone else or worst case envy, if we can say, Oh wow. So what is it I'm wanting to live that I'm not? Right. And how am I going to support myself in living that and making room for that and carving out time for that? You know, so that again, we don't even judge ourselves for that, but we say, this is information for me that something in my nature needs room, mm. it needs space, it needs container for expression. Great. Wow. Wonderful. So yeah. Kathleen, thank you so much for this You're conversation. Welcome. And what would we like people to share in the comments? Um, I would just love, I always love people to share their takeaways, their biggest yes. takeaways, because then it helps me see, you know, even what we're talking about. Is there anything else that you'd like people to share? Yeah. And if there are any ways that you find yourself using anything we've said that you're comfortable sharing, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. yeah. I would love to hear that. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So Kathleen, thank you so much. And I'm really okay. looking forward to our next conversation. Terrific. I'll see you next week. Okay. Great. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.